Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so excited to have you here with us for this book release, can't talk, book release event um, with Kenneth Price for uh, Whitman in Washington. And we're just so excited that you can be here. Um, Kenneth is joining us from Nebraska, which is amazing. That's the upside of these wonderful virtual events that we've been having. I'm gonna come back. All right, and my name is Caitlin Shea. I'm the Events and Media Director for Walt Women Birthplace Association. Um, if you're not familiar with us yet, we are a museum that's located in Long Island, New York in Huntington. And our museum is the house that Walt Women was born in 201 years ago. And you can come visit us for tours in person. We love when people visit. Um, we can share Walt Women's life with you um, all sorts of historical facts. And now we have these wonderful virtual events, um, which we also love sharing. So absolutely visit us in person, but we will have a tour very soon uh, up and coming of the wonderful house that Whitman was born in. All right, and I wanna start every single program by saying thank you so much to everyone who donates. It's been just such a meaningful experience to us. Um, we're growing in multitudes all the time. Um, reaching new international and national audiences, and your support just means so much. Um, something small like $5 that you might spend on a cup of Starbucks for us means so much when you multiply it by all the people that we're meeting and are starting to join us for these events. So thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. And for this event, a lot of people have been um, purchasing Whitman in Washington with us, and we have that actually for a 10% discount. And again, that's a lot of support for us too. So we appreciate that. I'm gonna be putting uh, all of our links in the chat and you'll see a link there for the book. Um, you'll also see a link for our YouTube. So all of our videos are up there from our previous virtual events. Um, and of course, please follow us because we love keeping you updated. We have events like this all the time. Um, and if you're interested in this, you'll definitely be interested in all of those events. So keep up to date with us. Um, and lastly, I also want to mention that we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this program. So Kenneth will be answering questions, but, you know, start brainstorming now about what you'll be asking so we can jump right into that at the end. Um, you can type in your questions or you can jump on camera um, and I'll let you know when we're going to be doing that. So now is my pleasure to introduce uh, WWBA Executive Director Cynthia Shore. Cynthia, I'm going to hand the spotlight over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Caitlin. And uh, we should all have a round of applause. I know we're probably muted, but uh, for the wonderful, wonderful work that Caitlin has been doing uh, for all the program, and especially tonight as we welcome Kenneth Price to the birthplace virtually. Thank you all for coming. I am Cynthia Shore, the Executive Director. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees who are wonderful supporters of the organization, very active, um, and really keep us uh, running and up to date. Uh, we all thank you and appreciate your attendance, your donations and your support, not only this year uh, through this COVID crisis, but uh, for now and to come, I'm sure. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker and presenter tonight, Ken Price. Uh, he was with us at the birthday celebration and um, in May, 2019. And so he's a wonderful friend of the birthplace, certainly a long-term member and uh, a supporter of all things Whitman. Ken received his BA from Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. And I don't necessarily announce where people get their degrees, but I love all those W's. And I love that it was Whitman College in Washington. And uh, I'd love to hear, Ken, if that had anything to do with your later in life uh, advocacy for Walt. After that, he earned his MA and his PhD degrees from the University of Chicago. Very impressive. He is a Hillegrass University professor of 19th century American literature and co-director of the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Price is the author of over 40 articles and author or editor of 11 books. His most recent book is co-edited with Ray Siemens, Literary Studies in the Digital Age, an Evolving Anthology. 
Of course, his other recent book is a book we're celebrating tonight, the launch of his Whitman in Washington, which I'm sure is going to um, uh, educate all of us and invite much discussion after the presentation. His other uh, recent books include Rescripting Walt Whitman, An Introduction to His Life and Work, co-authored with Ed Fulsa, who's one of our honorary trustees. And Ed, if you're with us tonight, a special hello to you. Another book that he has is To Walt Whitman, America. And I mention this because it's a main selection of the Reader's Subscription, a national book club. So Ken should be very proud that this book is part of the National Book Club. And I'm sure Walt Whitman would also be very proud that he is included in this. Since 1995, uh, uh, Ken has served as co-director of the Walt Whitman Archive, an electronic research and teaching tool that sets out to make Whitman's work for the first time easily and conveniently accessible to scholars, students, and general readers. And I must say, it makes it easily accessible to me as director as I feel the many questions that come to us from local and around the world about Walt Whitman. I shoot them over to Ed, and now Ken, that you're in my loop, I will be shooting you the questions also that I receive. The Whitman Archive has been awarded federal grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Historical Publication and Records Commission, the U.S. Department of Education, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services. I mention all of these to show the importance and the reverence that the nation is holding for the Whitman Archive and the work that Ken and Ed have done. In 2005, the Whitman Archive received a We the People grant from the NEH to build a permanent endowment to support ongoing editorial work. In 2009, Price received a Digital Innovation Award from American Council of Learned Societies to advance work on editing Whitman's Civil War writings. So that is but a short synopsis of the wonderful work Ken has been doing. We welcome you, Ken. We're thrilled to have you here. We will turn the spotlight over to you and listen as you launch this book, Whitman in Washington, and we are going to learn about all new and uh, interesting perspectives of your story of Whitman in Washington. Ken, welcome. Thank you, Cynthia and Caitlin. Um, really great to be here and I'm touched by that very generous introduction. Thank you for that. Uh, you asked about Whitman College and ironically, it's, it's not named for Walt Whitman, but instead for Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, who were missionaries who settled the area uh, and, and then actually uh, died in conflict with Native Americans. So um, racial interactions are not always uh, yeah. easy and happy and without conflict. And uh, that also ties into my talk tonight. Uh, I hope my remarks tonight are timely. Uh, obviously, we're going through a period of adjustment and stress and, uh, and recommitment on the part of so many to an attempt to achieve greater racial, racial justice in the US. Um, and we're also trying to figure out how we can have a healthy functioning multiracial democracy. So I think you'll see that my remarks tie in with those issues. Uh, there are also a number of illustrations along the way, so that'll uh, maybe lighten the mood here and there. So <laughs> hope for that. Uh, let's see, I should share screen and so give me a moment to do that. <clears throat> okay. Walt Whitman's life and writings were shaped by the actual places he experienced in Washington, D.C from 1863 to 1873, yet his life and writings on the spot were also filtered through the imagined spaces of the pastoral. In fact, in recent years, influential critics have repeatedly asserted that pastoralism leaves Whitman's Civil War writing compromised. They contend that he draws a 
pastoral or picturesque frame around the war, thereby, quote, legitimizing its violence, that the pastoral mode becomes an essential part of the poet's strategy for reuniting the nation, with the poems insisting on, quote, moral certainties which the recuperative force of the pastoral provides. Such critics see Whitman's pastoral as a retreat from social progressivism and poetic experimentation to a more traditional outlook shaped by nostalgia, escapism, and support of conventional 19th century Republican ideology. What exactly is the pastoral? Literary scholars tend to define it quite broadly as a celebration of the countryside or nostalgia for rustic life, subjects that feature common people and natural plenitude. <clears throat> Leo Marx's landmark study, The Machine in the Garden, contends that pastoral has been used to define the meaning of America ever since the age of discovery. With an unspoiled hemisphere in view, it seemed that mankind actually might realize the Arcadian dream that had been thought a poetic fantasy. That Arcadian dream offered bountifulness and also implied, as Will William Empson claims in some versions of pastoral, a beautiful relation between rich and poor. Exceptionalism comes into play because it is American Republican institutions that will permit the nation to achieve an idyllic relationship between classes and be between people and nature. Commentators have critiqued pastoralism for naturalizing or mystifying antebellum social hierarchies that exploited people of color and advanced American policies of Western expansion. But pastoralism is a complex tradition with anti-modern and anti-capitalist critique embedded in its very elements, and it can be used for many purposes. As Lawrence Buell notes, it has ideological multivalence. I argue today that Whitman repeatedly invokes pastoral conventions to disrupt them, often to reach anti-pastoral ends. Whitman knew these conventions, which were very much alive in the minds of writers during the Civil War, a time of cataclysmic upheaval. In a manuscript note dated October and November 1857, Whitman records that he was, quote, reading Virgil's Bucolics, Eclogues, and the Aeneid. He did not much admire the Aeneid, but he held that the Bucolics and Georgics are finely expressed. They are first rate. In fact, he owned two copies of the works of Virgil, literally translated in English prose with notes by Joseph Davidson. Late in life, Whitman annotated one of his copies of the Davidson translation, quote, had this volume with me in New York, Washington, and in Camden, 1862 to 1889. The edge stains are from the breaking of a bottle of Virginia wine in a trunk with it on a journey during the war there, WW. This story inscribed twice in this volume and also discussed in conversation with Horace Traubel seems to have been emblematic for Whitman. Perhaps he thought of Jesus and the parable of new wine and old wineskins as he contemplated the classics, Virginia, and the stains and shatterings of civil war. Virgil's eclogues and Georgics focused on the care of livestock because this type of labor suggested parallels between natural harmony and a particular view of social harmony. As the shepherd tends his flock, so the patriarch guides his family. <clears throat> And so a leader governs the people. Late in life, Whitman was criticized by some of his <clears throat> allies for a poem describing Emperor Wilhelm I of Germany as a shepherd and patriot and commemorating his death. <clears throat> Virgil wrote at a time of civil war and depicted herdsmen in rural settings who had been disappointed, or sorry, dispossessed of their own lands, who experienced revolutionary change, work and the vagaries of love. As Sarah Wagner McCoy has recently emphasized, some of the herdsmen Virgil depicted were slaves. So pastoral writing engaged servitude and exploitation from the beginning. These intertwined issues, comradeship, slavery, and the rightful ownership and use of land preoccupied Whitman too. This was in part because 19th century Anglo-American visual and literary texts strongly associated enslaved African-Americans and cattle, whether in the influential McGuffey readers or speeches by abolitionist and educator Horace Mann, 
who described a scene in the nation's capital where human beings are penned like cattle and kept like cattle that they may be sold like cattle as strictly and literally so as oxen and swine are kept and sold at Smithfield Shambles in London or at the Cattle Fair in Brighton. Whitman's commentary on cattle in Washington came when pro-slavery discourse equally, if more improvingly, depicted enslaved people as property and akin to livestock. As Jimmy King Killingsworth notes, enslaved people were legally defined as chattel, a word etymologically equivalent to cattle and related to capital, the root meaning for which goes back to the word for head, as in the heads of livestock, the countable items of property that can be reduced to a number and valued accordingly. Illustrators from Harper's Weekly tried to turn the legal distinction or lack thereof into humor not long after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. In this image, the chaotic lines of houses like those in the man of color's clothes suggest nature gone to seed. They contrast with the careful, neat depiction of the animals. The man of color is represented as ruinous of the pastoral in his preening self-regard, an attitude repeated in the much smaller figure in the front yard, whose chin also juts upward at a sharp angle to highlight a false vanity. The future or potential property owner is characterized via vertical lines. His hopes and his relationship to the landscape are severely restricted by horizontal lines everywhere behind him, implicitly restricting his movement and confining him visually as enslaved African-Americans were often actually confined and seeming to limit his destiny and that of his fellows. There is no arable land or prospect opening out in front of him. As Michael Bennett argues, typically for early African-American writers, a pastoral vision offered little solace for confronting the real travails of this world, which are obfuscated and kept in place by a mythic understanding of the relationship between humans and their environment. We recall that in Frederick Douglass's famous narrative, he pines for Baltimore and wishes to escape not from, but to the city. Like many African-American writers from Douglass forward, Whitman rarely displayed a view of the rural landscape as an ethically neutral or even beneficent space. African-Americans questioned romanticized views of country life, not only because they were excluded from the pastoral's yeoman ideal, but because they too often encountered unpredictable violence and degradation on plantations. In fact, the Euro-American bias in pastoralism has prompted what Bennett calls a corresponding tradition of anti-pastoralism in African-American culture. Just prior to the war, Whitman made clear that he was alive to a diverse city as Give Me the Splendid sun, Silent Sun shows, but he was also cognizant that the countryside was racialized. His longings for home, published 1860 to 61, is an anti-pastoral poem that he later retitled, O Magnet South. In a perceptive analysis of longings, Jacob Wilkenfeld notes that Whitman sets out to, quote, deconstruct the idyllic vision of Southern pastoral, exposing an elision of the evils of slavery from Southern poetic representations and thus underscores Southern hypocrisy. He does this by adopting a discourse similar to that of the Southern pastoral Republican mode, even speaking in the voice of a Southerner. Yet after offering a catalog of the natural splendors of the South and the productive fields of crops of cotton, rice, sugar, hemp, and corn, Whitman shifts tone and undermines the idealized Southern pastoral mood when he describes the Southern swampland with the fugitive slave in his concealed hut. Southern depictions of pastoralism in the visual arts ordinarily erased slave labor. Whitman demonstrates a sophisticated awareness that the meanings of nature are dependent upon one's subject position as a white or as a free or enslaved black. In a key parenthetical line, Whitman brings to light what the pastoral, or in this case, the South has repressed. Um, the line is right here. <clears throat> the piney odor and the gloom, the awful natural stillness, here in these dense swamps, the freebooter carries his gun and the fugitive slave has his concealed hut. As in Virgil, 
the dispossessed, here the speaker as a pseudo southerner, longs for the idyllic countryside where human life follows natural rhythms. But Whitman exposes this as a false harmony based on coercion and racial ideology, not nature. The fugitive slave hut in the Southern landscape disrupts the pastoral and its legitimacy. Moreover, the freebooter, a word applied to plunderers, robbers, and armed trackers of slaves, underscores the dangers so often hidden in accounts of Southern pastoral. Whitman's poem is an early refutation of the Southern pastoral myth that would most fully develop during Reconstruction and the post-Reconstruction years, a myth rooted in white supremacy and misleading about the role of slavery. As has been already suggested, and as David Miller notes, for many 19th century white readers, the swamp was seen as, a, as weird and noxious, fixing it as repulsive, as a repulsive, if intriguing, emblem of evil, a natural hell. This generalization is far less true for Native Americans, African Americans, and those sympathetic to them. The swamp signified differently for those in asymmetrical conflicts. To besieged African Americans and Native Americans, a swamp could change the power balance, offering sanctuary, camouflage, and a def defensible position. Whitman describes the swamp and longings for home as, quote, half impassable, infested by reptiles, resounding with the bellow of the alligator, the sad nose noises of the night owl and the wildcat and the whir of the rattle rattlesnake. If any place functions as an anti-pastoral setting, it is the swamp sought out by fugitives, a locale paradoxically dangerous and safe, functioning differently across racial lines the swamp as haven highlights the or that the ordinary settings fugitives had fled from could be even more terrifying. If the swamp was a natural hell, it often seemed better than the humanly produced hell of everyday life. In the swamp, at least, there was a chance for seclusion and escape. In 1856, Harper's monthly account of the dismal swamp where Nat Turner's banditti fled after his rebellion included an illustration of an African-American man, Osman. The name associates him with the founder of the Ottoman dynasty, a larger than life leader. It's reasonable to assume Whitman saw this illustration since he was a reader of Harper's Monthly and Harper's Weekly in these years. Osman in the, this engraving by David Hunter Strother appears to have melded with the swamp. The lines in his shirt are nearly indistinguishable from the snaky thicket from which he half emerges. This image clarifies how the swamp can be both a refuge and a place of bondage of a different sort. Osman has broken the chains of slavery by immersing himself in a thicket of natural entanglements. The only straight lines in the picture show his gun held in a powerful bare arm, independent, moving forward, and capable of self-defense, Osman is nonetheless not threatening. His rifle points away from the viewer and is not ready to be fired. He has white hair associated with age, wisdom, and a lack of aggression. His glance, turned slightly aside, but nonetheless riveted on the viewer, expresses a gentleness and sensitivity, all the more remarkable in light of the foregrounded, oversized hands. The key difference between longings for home and Strother's engraving is that Whitman's fugitive slave is not seen with a rifle. Only the freebooter in Whitman's poem carries his gun, emphasizing their imbalance of power. Whitman's Civil War landscapes are ambiguous, recurrently marked by destruction and debris, swamps and scorched earth, and they highlight moral uncertainties and quandaries. The messiness, misunderstandings, and challenges facing any effort to recuperate the past with its history of exploitation, characterize his Ethiopia Saluting the Colors, a poem composed in 1867, though not published until 1871. On a variety of grounds, this poem has made many white critics since then cringe. But it was praised by Langston Hughes as one of the most beautiful poems in our language concerning a Negro subject. And other black artists, including the poet Melvin Tolson, and the composers Samuel Coleridge Taylor and H.T. Burley have revered it as well. Ed Folsom has argued that it has always seemed that African-American writers and critics 
see and hear something in the poem that most white writers do not. If in fact the poem is seen and heard differently along racial lines, it may be because of the differing way two key terms, Ethiopia and Sherman can be understood. The soldier in the poem baldly states what many Europeans and white Americans believed. People from Africa, like the elderly woman he observes were, quote, hardly human. Whitman's various comments on Ethiopia in both private drafts and published writings are far more complex. He described Ethiopia as the bedrock foundation of civilization, a key precursor, if nonetheless primitive in outlook. In the 1860 poem eventually titled Song of the Broad Axe, Whitman mentions the venerable and harmless men of Ethiopia. Even this limited praise of Ethiopia led to parodic treatment of his views in pro-slavery publications and in Vanity Fair. In the US, views of Ethiopia in the 1860s and 1870s could fall anywhere on the spectrum from those who mocked Whitman's comments about that land's venerable and harmless men to those who held that Ethiopia was a land, quote, favored by the gods and that the Ethiopians were, quote, closest to the gods. This latter line of thinking available in classical dictionaries and possibly through oral tradition too would resonate for African-Americans. Also important to them were General William Tecumseh Sherman and his ill-fated effort to set aside land for African-Americans. Sherman, in fact, provides an opportunity to see through the pastoral to the issues at stake in the poem. As a post-war reflection on the conflict and its implications, this poem is controversial because of its belated treatment of race. Whitman did not address slavery and emancipation in any meaningful way in the initial publication of Drum Taps, though he added this poem to the so-called Drum Taps cluster of Leaves of Grass in 1881. Whitman's dramatization of an encounter between an elderly black woman and a soldier join many other verbal and visual treatments in the Northern press of African-American women and children encountering federal troops. As early as 1862, for example, Harper's Weekly depicted an African-American woman and her children greeting Union soldiers. In which it offered a mocking rendering of black dialect Although the caricatured woman ostensibly seeks freedom, her position behind three thick horizontal bars of offense make her appear just as far from emancipation as Osman in his swampy entanglement. The image offers no sign of blacks and whites sharing the same space, nor does it give the woman access to an open pastoral landscape. The woman's smiling face, open arms and widely spread legs distance her from the ideals of white bourgeois womanhood, of course, and the fencing suggests that firm barriers are in place to block any efforts to escape, something her dialect signals too. Yet the one child pushing through the fence and another wriggling under it suggests that separation or segregation is doomed to fail, at least for this future generation. Whitman's own imagining of the interaction between an African-American woman and Sherman's army was almost certainly shaped by such depictions in the popular press. To take another example of this theme, an unknown artist in Harper's Weekly caricatured an open mouthed slave along with the purported comment is all them Yankees that's passing. The African-American woman appears stunned and possibly alarmed. There's a discrepancy between the text and image here that was fairly typical as Harper's writers were often more sympathetic than illustrators who came from a tradition of caricature and satire. In the picture, a porch railing leaves the woman fenced in and limited black mobility is also emphasized in the caption describing her as, quote, one of the colored population who watched from the, from the plantation from which probably she was never 10 miles in her life. However, the plantation setting in which she theatrically addresses an offstage mistress or master suggests some agency, though it is tied to the movements of all them marching soldiers. Indeed, the viewer following her gaze is in on the joke. The endless number of Yankees is precisely what the slave's seeming astonishment underscores. 
the prospect is of her master's defeat. In contrast, Whitman's elderly woman, Ethiopia, though she may seem a caricature too, differs importantly from popular de depictions of enslaved women. She has both self-awareness and agency and her evident understanding, not only of the significance of the Northern invasion and its implications for her freedom is matched by her refusal to disavow her African roots. She's not shocked or overwhelmed by the prospect of freedom, nor is she caught between staying put and crossing over to the Union Army. In the poem as a whole, she epitomizes much of African-American history up until the moment of encounter with a soldier from your Sherman's army. African childhood and capture, middle passage crossing of the Atlantic, long decades as an enslaved person, and ultimate seizing of the opportunity of emancipation. Whitman's poem, to return to it, like the popular illustrations employs black dialect. Widely understood as a comic mode at this time, Whitman uses it to satirize white Southern pastoral. Me master years a hundred since from my parents sundered a little child. They caught me as the savage beast is caught. Then hither me across the sea, the cruel slaver brought. Whitman's language rings false because our minds have been shaped by later achievements of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Charles Chestnut, Langston Hughes, William Faulkner, Toni Morrison, and a host of other artists who've highlighted the range and eloquence of black dialect. The problem in Ethiopia saluting the colors is not that Whitman has presented African-American speech as a barbarous deviation from a norm, but that he failed to recognize the extraordinary expressive capacity of black dialect when rendered realistically. In treating black dialect, Whitman and the popular press exhibit different types of failures of authenticity. The diction Whitman attributes to the elderly woman is overly poeticized with its inversions, two instances of internal rhyme, and a chiasmic heroic simile caught me as the savage beast is an inversion that speaks back to and disputes the Northern soldier's claim that she is hardly human. The language of Ethiopia is akin to 18th century anti-slavery poetry and is in some ways reminiscent of Phyllis Wheatley. Antique diction is not altogether inappropriate if Ethiopia is indeed 100 years old. We only need to separate author from narrator to see that Whitman's depiction of white racism is not the same as his endorsing it. The elderly woman resists dehumanizing interpretations, indignities, and deprivations that one of Sherman's soldiers shows little eagerness to correct. That soldier says, "'Tis while our army lines Carolina's sand and pines, Forth from thy hovel door, thou, Ethiopius, comest to me, as under doughty Sherman I marched to the, toward the sea. Though he probably didn't intend it, what comes to mind through the naming of Sherman and what would resonate particularly for African-American readers is the possibility of an improved life precisely through the promise of land possession, land promised via Sherman's Field Order 15. In this famous order of January 16, 1865, Sherman gave African-Americans, quote, possessory rights to a strip of coastland stretching from Charleston, South Carolina to Northern Florida, along with nearby sea islands after consulting with a group of black ministers. These orders serving to redistribute roughly 400,000 acres of land and 40 acre segments to newly freed black families are commonly understood as the origin of the 40 acres and a mule promise. The Union Army confiscated land abandoned by fleeing whites. Sherman's motivation was in part to rid himself of the estimated 19,000 African-Americans who attached themselves to his army. It's also worth <clears throat> noting that the 40 acre plot accords with the pastoral view of Thomas Jefferson except for the racial dimension of a nation built on small 40 acre family farms. Whitman no doubt read about this order in a variety of places, including in his government work and in the daily papers. Regrettably, this order was rescinded by the government not long after. The double dealing of the government may explain some of the oddities of the poem, including Ethiopia's initial greeting of the American flag as a sign of liberation. In the first stanza, Sherman's soldier is more confused by her liberation than the elderly woman. So he asks, 
Why, rising by the roadside here, do you the colors greet? By the end of the poem, though the woman remains respectful, she curtsies to the regiments. She also goes silent, wagging her head with turban bound yellow, red, and green. She wears the colors of the Ethiopian flag, displaying pride in her African roots, even as she honors an American flag, strange and marvelous, that could both conceive of land redistribution and betray its promise. Ethiopia saluting the colors may be profitably read in conjunction with Winslow Homer's near Andersonville, a painting known previously as At the Cabin Door and also as Captured Liberators before Homer's own title for the painting was recently discovered. Whitman also, excuse me, Whitman almost certainly did not know of this painting. It was not exhibited and seems to have only been seen briefly at auction in New York City on April 19th, 1866, when Whitman was in Washington. So rather than arguing for its influence on him, we can recognize a commonality of concern and subject matter. Homer covered the Civil War for Harper's, which as we've seen regularly published images and stories of former slaves encountering Union soldiers. As noted, Whitman read Harper's and his poem is unusual in comparison in envisioning the black woman and white soldier on the same road with no barriers separating them, sharing the same national space. Homer's painting clarifies how difficult this was to do. Both Whitman and Homer depict an African-American woman emerging alone from a modest building wearing a turban. In Whitman's poem, it is the African-American woman who acts as an individual, whereas the soldier, part of a marching unit, is part of a herd, though he does have agency and his thoughts and words shape the poem. So too in Homer's painting, soldiers are in the background, prisoners of war being marched to Andersonville, the Civil War prison camp infamous for its high death rate. A young adult woman in an individualized pose is framed in the doorway, in the foreground, absorbed in thought, seeming to muse stoically on the Union prisoners, now captured and under the Confederate flag, no doubt justifiably concerned about not only them, but a future her gaze cannot discern. Any hope for landowning or pastoral harmony is remote from this scene. Generally speaking, Homer saw promise in the younger generation of Blacks and painted them with sensitivity and insight. This woman in her dignity and self-awareness is akin to the woman in Ethiopia saluting the colors. Eastman Johnson's Union Soldiers Accepting a Drink, a striking work in its own right through its handling of spatial dynamics also sheds light on Ethiopia saluting the colors. The painting overturns conventions of 19th century American art about the decorum for representing African-Americans and whites together. Albert Boehm has demonstrated that the convention of deploying figures in a composition to mirror social hierarchies in real life applies especially to pictures of racial types. In this painting, the African-American woman is in the highest position at the apex of the triangle of adult figures. Unlike Homer's near Andersonville, but like Whitman's poem, Johnson's painting offers a view of Union soldiers interact directly, interacting directly with an African-American woman. In their paintings, both Johnson and Homer position the African-American woman as framed by the threshold. Of the images considered here, this is the only one with any direct claims to the pastoral. Strikingly, the only figure with an apparent opening to the land, to the promise of the pastoral, is a young woman in the shadows watching the older woman's hospitality. She is perhaps not the center of interest in a painting ostensibly about the warm welcome white Union soldiers received from people of color in the South, highlighting a sentimental dimension to the painting. Yet the girl and her sunlit path toward an open field and future, small but promising in the distance behind her, rivals the seemingly more important reinscription of a service role for African-Americans. The adult woman provides beer for the soldiers as the sign above her indicates. There are rocks in front of the young woman as she looks on at this moment of service, but there's only light and smooth ground ahead of her if she turns toward the light, the opening and the land. And painted later than Homer, its sunny vistas suggest reconstruction along the lines of pastoral social harmony. 
no threat is posed to white patriarchy. Whitman too has Ethiopia venturing out to the roadside, moving beyond service and domesticity. She is at a significant remove from her hovel. She travels further and interacts in more complex ways with the soldier than the women depicted by Homer and Johnson. In fact, in Whitman's poem, there's an interesting quality of movement, different from that of a fugitive or a soldier. By crossing to the Union lines, she acts more independently than is possible for either. The mere fact of travel is significant since slave codes, since slave codes had restricted black mobility. Nor in Ethiopia does the woman, the woman serve white soldiers. She serves herself. Whitman's Ethiopia saluting the colors does not place the elderly woman in a domestic context. Her positioning highlights the more open-ended future for those newly emancipated. In Homer, we feel for soldiers through the woman's empathy. That's not her function in Johnson and Whitman. The poet depicts an anti-pastoral scene in the Carolina sand and brings an aged and resilient black woman to the center of attention. She has labored a hundred years only to have land promised and denied. Typical statements about pastoral fit Whitman poorly. Whitman's poetry and prose of the war years in reconstruction rarely invoked the pastoral to wax nostalgic about the past. He focused instead on the crises of the present and the vistas of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you so much. I see all of us with maniacs are, are smiling. I can see it on video. All right, yeah. and if everyone wants to unmute just for a moment, um, we can give a big, well-deserved round of applause for Kenneth. Hey, thanks. Thank you so much, Kenneth. And um, oh, you know, do you want to just turn off the uh, PowerPoint just so we can? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. I'll do the stop share. That's what yeah, I'm stop doing. share. That's one. Yep. All right, wonderful. And um, and we can jump right into our questions as well. Um, if you want to type them in the chat, I'll read them. Um, or you can jump on video too. Up to you. And you just want to make sure that you're unmuted if you're going to talk to us and you're muted if you're not. <laughs> okay. Let's see. We also have a lot of wonderful comments in there as you were uh, giving your presentation, Kenneth. Let's see. Uh, Jerry says, Kenneth, you think the literary, literary trope of the swamp derives from Pilgrim's Progress. Nice idea. I'd, I'd never thought about that before, but it, it might well. I mean, Pilgrim's Progress was one of the most popular books in, in the US for centuries. So uh, I like that, that possibility. Thanks for the comment. And then we have Martha Deed. Hi, Martha. Hello. Uh, what has inspired you to settle on the topic of women in Washington? Does that phase of Whitman's life have particular significance? Uh, people have uh, been fascinated by Whitman in New York. They've been fascinated by Whitman in New Orleans. They've been fascinated by Whitman in Philadelphia and Camden, all, all those um, different cities for different reasons. New York at the beginning of his career when he was at his most creative, New Orleans for the romance of it and possible love affairs, possible st stimulating his thinking to lead to the first leaves of grass. Uh, and, you know, Camden and Philadelphia years at the end of his life when he pulled together the complete edition of Leaves of Grass and his complete prose and had so many fascinating conversations with visitors and with Horace Traubel. It's always seemed to me that the Washington decade, uh, though studied by some people, has been underestimated in its importance and fascination. Uh, I think what Whitman did working the Civil War hospitals is a humanitarian achievement of the absolute first order, just an extraordinary thing, uh, giving so much time and risking his own health at the height of his career when he could have been spending time writing or, you know, uh, tending to himself, but he, he gave himself selflessly. And so that, that to me was moving. The other aspect, the other thing that drove me toward 
feeling I needed to write about Whitman and Washington, that I was positioned that it would be crazy for me not to write about Whitman in Washington. As, as some of you may know, I, about 10 years ago, discovered 3,000 documents in Whitman's handwriting that had been previously not identified. That these were written when Whitman was a clerk working in the attorney general's office. He was a scribe, a secretary of the day before typewriters and word processors. So he's writing things out longhand. Um, and so it required somebody who recognized his hand to identify the documents. But um, these al allow us to pinpoint to the exact day and year when Whitman was aware of any number of issues, including the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and the efforts of the, what's now the Department of Justice um, to beat back the Klan in those years. Uh, but any other, any number of other issues that were percolating at the time were also coming before the Attorney General's office. So, you know, I felt that I had uh, unusual access to a cache of material that other scholars were either unaware of or less aware of, and that I, I really ought to try to make something of that in a, in a book. Thanks. Caitlin, could I ask a question orally? Yes, absolutely. Go for it. Uh, just, it's, it's, it's a little longer than I would, could, could write out easily. So um, I'm wondering, two, two questions, Ken. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the Whitman's racist uh, comments at times. And I wonder well, how you deal with that in, in your book. Um, in, in prose writings, I think it's where he was, uh, has a, a couple of times was uh, made some derogatory remarks. So that's the first point. The second point is, um, in the current climate, there's been some um, tendency to relate Whitman to John Brown. Um, and he portrays himself as being present for John Brown's hanging in the uh, um, year of meteors. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he wasn't there. And that was one of his imaginary um, uh, being in the right place at the right time. But I'd like you to clarify on that. Where was he when th that happened? And, and where was he ideologically and, and emotionally in regard to, to the John Brown events? So thank you. Sure. I've, I've uh, written a fair amount about Whitman and race over my career and, and struggled with it because it's a powerful, important, vexing, disturbing, occasionally dispiriting issue. And, uh, and I wanted to make Whitman and race, one of the major themes of the book. And so it's threaded through, I think every chapter of the book. Um, and it comes really into play in the final two chapters when I'm dealing with the scribal documents, the ones he wrote in the attorney general's office when he is exposed and he wrote, he wrote as many as 30 documents that are dealing with the Klan. So he knew very much about the rise of white supremacy and white violence and vigilanteism and people trying to beat back um, just the very beginnings of uh, black civil rights and the very beginnings of black voting rights and things like that. And uh, the fact that he didn't speak out more forcefully given all that he knew is a huge disappointment. And it's, and it's a hard thing to get your mind around because what so, what so many of us warm to in Whitman is, is his embrace of the U.S. as the teeming nation of nations and his encompassing celebration of all types of people from all walks of life with all hues and religious backgrounds and immigration status and whatnot. And so it seems to be a departure from the early Whitman. And so I think I do think that there is a troubling um, veering toward increased uh, conservatism, occasionally reactionary attitudes in his later life. In this, he doesn't justify it, but it it does situate him in a broader tendency that is cultural, that the North 
in the post-war years became fatigued with the issues of black rights that had roiled the nation in the pre-war years, abolitionist movement leading to the war, all of the suffering of the war, a lot of Northern intellectuals, uh, journal editors felt exhausted by it and retreated from support of black rights. You see it notably, for example, in the Atlantic Monthly, which had led the charge in, in or been one of the places leading the charge for abolitionism and then reversed itself on, on black rights. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a huge problem and, and something I try to tra tackle in the book and it's something that I felt more pressure about and more anxiety about and more concern about and f almost occasionally felt uh, paralyzed by because I was writing during the Trump era. And I felt like all of these issues were really current issues too, that, that this was uh, an American reckoning with race that you know is still happening and and we we need to get right and we don't have it right yet um, so that's the my answer to your first one and then with John Brown and I mean he wasn't there present um, it's interesting you know he was he's uh, was occasionally taken to to appear like John Brown according to some viewers but you know, that visual appearance is, seems to me insignificant. Their personalities were quite different. Their, uh, John Brown was, you know, com committed to taking extreme actions to right a profound wrong. And Whitman was generally not extreme in the stances he took on things. I will say though that in the great poem, The Sleepers, there's at least a glimmer of uh, entertainment of the idea of uh, black revolt, uh, slave revolt, 1855 poem, as you know, uh, and, and really the manuscript sources of that that Ed Folsom and I have both written about uh, show that, that um, black revolution and, and implicitly endorses that the need for black violence to to try to achieve justice. Um, and that's an interesting alignment with uh, John Brown, I'd say. Can may I ask a follow up um, on that? Um, I, hi, my name's uh, Josh. I actually live in Washington, not too far for, um, from where Walt used to live. Yeah. Um, as I'm asking this question, I realize this is the only crowd that will probably recognize the photo behind me. Um, nice. I, 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 last week, a colleague asked me why I had a picture of Karl Marx on my dresser. I, I had a very awkward <laughs> conversation. Um, so I haven't, you know, I've encountered this poem before, the Ethiopia poem. And, and to be very frank, I always, Kind of viewed it as like almost irredeemable, right? I mean, like it's the exoticizing, it's the otherizing, um, and, and I viewed it as something of a black market. And actually, I really appreciate like what you did to give it a little bit more nuance and, and, and context. But you said something that just fascinated me, and would like to ask a little bit more. You talked about how subsequent black authors or poets looked at it, you know, in the 20th century. Um, and I'm very curious, you know, especially um, with the backdrop of Howard's question about, you know, the overall racial legacy of Walt. I, I'd be grateful if you could share whatever you know about, you know, how people like James Baldwin or others um, looked back retrospectively on that poem in particular and on his, um, on, on his, his racial legacy and, and how they wrestled with it, um, you, you know, over the years. Thanks. Um, right. I, I mean, Melvin Tolson and Langston Hughes are the only two um, African American poets that I know of that have spoken explicitly about it. And I'd love to, if others know of others who have spoken to it, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. Um, you know, your question opens out into a broader one, which has to do with the overall African American response to Whitman, particularly that overall response in light of what has now been known for you know, decades, the, the uh, threading of a racist element within Whitman's thought, along with all the great stuff that we love. And um, Langston Hughes is in a way, I think symptomatic of the, what I would say the general take, you know, if, if we can broadly generalize about all African-American writers on Whitman, th that is to say that it's, it's marked by generosity. Um, Hughes 
is remarkably um, large-minded when he's challenged. He, he was writing in the Chicago Defender about Whitman and he wrote a pra a essay praising Whitman and he was challenged by uh, a, a professor from Roosevelt University at the time uh, who was citing chapter and verse on Whitman and racist remarks and and Hughes basically said something like, you know, we need to to take the best in someone like Whitman and and go with that and not dwell on on the shortcomings. And Hughes was just absolutely fascinated by Whitman and you know wrote um, collected three anthologies of Whitman materials, wrote multiple essays treating Whitman, multiple poems that you know take off from Whitman. Um, and more recently, I mean, you could go on and on talking about the African American writers, so I won't take up all the time mentioning them, but I'll, I will uh, mention a couple. Um, to on the positive side, con continuing that that thread. Very recently, Natasha Trethway, recently poet laureate of the United States, writes really powerfully and movingly about Whitman. She's not unaware of of the problems in Whitman, but she also is is gracious and um, large-minded in her approach. Um, Baldwin, I, I don't remember saying much that he said much about Whitman. It would be interesting to find more. I mean, there's a little bit, there's a reference to Whitman in Giovanni's room. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think he connects to Whitman through, through gay issues uh, along with the race issues. Um, but, um, but maybe the more interesting one is, uh, Oh, the person who wrote Flight to Canada, um, what's what's the writer's name? Um, I'm blanking on it, but, um, oh, it'll come to me later. But um, Flight, to Can Flight to Canada is a fabulous novel written in the um, mid 1970s by a African-American writer. And he takes to task uh, all basically all um, white 19th century American writers really eviscerates them in a most amusing and brilliant way. Um, Ishmael Reed is the name that I was having trouble coming up with. Uh, it, it, if you haven't read the book, I, I very strongly recommend it to you. It's fabulous. Uh -huh. May I ask a question? Um, I do want to add too that we have an upcoming program actually that will be um, a reading and discussion group about James Baldwin's essays um, and uh, Whitman Noir by Ivy Wilson. So if you're interested in that, again, please keep checking our events. We are adding more all the time. Um, and yeah, you're, this is a great video for people to see um, even after this event that they can learn more and get interested and ready for this discussion group that we'll be having. Um, all right, so I'd love to go to Catherine Waitnes. She's had her virtual hand up for a while. <laughs> Catherine, you go right ahead now. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ken. It's Hi, nice Catherine. to see you. Um, yeah. I'm happy to jump on here after Josh because I'm actually currently teaching a seminar both at the senior level and the grad level on James Baldwin and Walt Whitman together. Mm -hmm. And the students are doing a, a really great job. Um, and I have sort of like a two-part offering here. Uh, one comment, which is that so far, you know, we started with a lot of students looking to cancel Whitman, and um, I tried to kind of help them engage with his ideas, especially in the poetry, which I feel like is almost um, akin to the American founding documents. You know, the poetry is like this ideal version of things, and maybe the prose is what actually happens as opposed to the American family, you know, founding documents. Um, but what we have found and what's been most fruitful is to think about Whitmanian camaraderie and that kind of one-to-one -one relationship that he encourages alongside Baldwin's idea of brotherly love um, from the fire next time and uh, this idea that you can't get past the hatred that shapes the United States unless you combat it with love um, and the students have done a lot of really good work on that but I still feel like um, that problem of the canceling of the earlier writers is playing a large role in discussions. And, and I'm really open to that conversation. I, I understand where they're coming from. 
Um, but I'm wondering, you know, especially with a poem like this Ethiopia poem that students always point to as proof of Whitman's racism, um, how this has worked for you? Like, have you brought this poem into discussions with them in the ways that you read it with this imagery? Um, how, what, what, does it, what does it do for the students? And how are you finding that these topics are working in your own classroom? Thank you. Sure. Uh -huh. Thanks, Catherine. An interesting set of comments and questions. <clears throat> well, let me take up first the cancel idea that you talk about because, uh, you know, Whitman, interestingly, sort of predicted something like that when he talks about, you know, needing to destroy the teacher and, um, and sort of welcoming it. And the final two sentences or three sentences, I don't know, maybe it's three of my book are Whitman is not beyond his culture, but of it for better and worse. He invited us to complete him or to defeat him. There's much work to be done. I mean, it's, it's, so Whitman both knew that he didn't have all the answers. He didn't get everything right. And he was sort of laying out a starting point he was hoping for future discussion. And so I think it's fine to point to the shortcomings and to find, you know, point out all the warts, point out all the inconsistencies and uh, prejudicial statements and, you know, but at the same time, we need to um, have some sympathy to people in their time and, and, and place people in, in their time and context. And it's not to forgive them of everything, um, but, you know, just think how silly people a hundred years from us are going to think our ideas are. I mean, they're, they're going to be flabbergasted at the silly things that we thought. So, you know, there's, there's that dimension of it. Um, with regard to Ethiopia and my teaching of it, I will confess that I don't believe I have ever taught the poem in a class. And uh, I think that's because up until I wrote about it, I thought it was hateful and terrible and, you know, a bad poem in every regard. I mean, you know, uh, I didn't like the way it sounded. I didn't like its use of language and I didn't like the stereotypical treatment of people. And I thought it, it, it had, um, you know, it was interlaced with racism. And, and, but it was only when I, you know, I was writing this book on Whitman and Washington and I was writing a book that I was trying to run a theme dealing with race through it. And it's, it's really his only poem about the civil war that treats an African-American character straight on. So, you know, I couldn't dodge it. So, but then the other thing was I, I began to take seriously African-American people have seen something important here. Let me see if I can figure out what that might be. Uh, and so I took a stab at it. I don't know if I got it right, but I'm, you know, <laughs> I, I like the poem a lot more now that I've written about it than I ever did before. I mean, I've started to persuade myself. <laughs> well, and I would definitely use it with my own students in the way that you are sharing today. I think it would really help them a lot. and. Um, just one more really quick thing on James Baldwin, which is that for Giovanni's room, the epigraph that he uses is from that famous hounded slave part of Song of Myself. And so he says, I am the man, I suffered, I was there. And if you go back to the poem, of course, you see that it's from the section where Whitman is taking on these various persona. And I think, um, of course, Baldwin knew that. And that the thing that really seems to connect them from my perspective that rescues Whitman a little bit is that radical empathy, which of course is not the word he would have used, but the ability to try at least to see things from someone else's perspective and for Baldwin as well. And so people often will say, I think, oh, well, Baldwin writes back to Whitman because they're both gay. And I actually think that the empathy part of that is, is much more significant throughout all of Baldwin's works and all of Whitman's works. And that Whitman, I think, sort, sort of hides some of the romance and love and the queer attraction a little bit, not very successfully in his poetry. And I think Baldwin in the same way, like, yes, he's interested in writing about that, but it's, it's that empathy, it's the, it's the pull back to, I was there, I, I wanted to experience these things and see through someone else's eyes in a novel where he's writing from a white 
man's vocalized perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, yeah, I, I'm, at any rate, the students have a lot of smart ideas. Um, so I'd recommend putting these writers together if any of you haven't tried it yet. <laughs> Right, wonderful. Um, Hi. Of, oh. um, I just have like a quick question. It's Cause um, the book that he wrote, it seems really interesting. And I was always told that everything you write has an like a background or an inspiration. So I wanted to know like what inspired him to write it because there's like multiple pieces of inspiration but I know like what was the main inspiration and like what made him so determined to write about that specific topic okay uh, if you don't mind I could I get a just a clarification on the question you're asking what the main inspiration Whitman had for writing uh, no that, the book you you were just talking about oh my own book what yeah, my the book that you wrote so what inspired you to write it yeah I mean this book took a long time and it kind of only gradually came into focus I I I don't know I think it was more than a decade in process so that that's a, a long time and it it uh, but the, I mean, I, I, I think I already pointed to it in a way. I, the urgency of the last four years for me made me want to think about Whitman in Washington and, you know, what he was doing there and the fabulous things he did there, uh, along with things that are more disappointing. Um, and I, well, the other, other thing I can say that might be of use to you is that along with uh, doing um, digital work on the Walt Whitman archive, I um, some years ago began to do a online site called Civil War Washington, a, a web resource. And we were interested in I, I started the project with a guy who's an expert on Lincoln, and I thought, you know, a Whitman scholar and a Lincoln scholar, Whitman and Lincoln were both in Washington at the same time. What if we did something that studied the, the city? And the more I studied about the city, the more fascinated I became because the city quadrupled in size in four years. Its racial and ethnic makeup changed profoundly. All kinds of business people, doctors, prostitutes, um, you know, ne'er do good ne'er do wells and whatnot flooded into the city. Um, it was an amazing place that um, only had a single paved street. Um, you know, and it had a defective sewer system, and they threw rotting carcasses uh, of cattle feeding um, Union soldiers in the canal behind the White House it wasn't called the White House then; it was called the Executive Mansion. Uh, and that the toxic uh, stuff emanating from the canal killed one of Lincoln's sons. Um, you know, this is a pretty fascinating city that that Whitman is living in. And I wanted to write a book that interlaced changes and developments in the city with changes in development in Whitman, his life and his poetry. That really answers my question. Thank you. And <laughs> another question would be, what does it take to be a, a really successful writer like you? <laughs> well, thank you, very kind. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Some people I think write, you know, it, well, there's different kinds of writing. There's creative writing and, and then there's the kind of scholarly writing and the, those of us that do scholarly writing are more plotting, I suppose. And we spend a lot of time in research libraries and we travel to the Library of Congress and see Barbara Bear and people like that who's I think on this call. Um, and uh, you know, you work hard and you, you work really long weeks and then you write and you write and you rewrite and you, 
you know, I mean, I don't know how it is for other people, but I find writing to be one of the most difficult things I ever try to do. It's it's very painful and difficult. And when I hate the stuff that I first write, I really do. And I'm not just like making that up. I just really find it unpleasant, the first draft of anything. It's it's so inadequate. Um, but I, I have a stubbornness about writing and I just keep coming back to it and keep fine tuning it and revising it. And, you know, you try to get as many smart people that you know to read it as you can. Uh, and uh, like my wife, Wendy, who's on this, uh, reads things and makes me sound smarter than I am and helps me with the art analysis like in this one. And uh, so, uh, you know, you, you cheat when you can and, and hope for the best. <clears throat> All right. And again, we have so many wonderful questions here in the chat. Um, I'm going to make sure that you get them all, Kenneth. Um, I hate to cut it short, but if we answered them all, I think we'd be here a very long time. So, um, but yeah. I want to say thank you, you so them. much. Sure. Yeah. yeah. If you, if we can save the chat comments, uh, mm -hmm. I'll try to respond to uh, most of these if I can. Yeah, okay. that'd be wonderful. I can get you the email addresses and everything too. Okay, Cornell. that'd be great. Thank and you. Answer everyone. Thank you for taking the time for doing that. Oh, sure. <laughs> great. All right. So I want to give another big round of applause to Kenneth Price. If everyone wants to unmute for just a moment. Do that again. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Great questions. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank right. you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here too. It means so much to us. Uh, I'm gonna share those links one more time in case you missed them in the beginning. And again, we have so many wonderful virtual events and we can come into your living rooms now with these sorts of events and we wanna keep doing that. So absolutely stay uh, up to date with everything we have going on. Um, we have an email blast list. We have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So stay on board with everything we're doing and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. Good job, Caitlin. Thank you. Have a good weekend, Thank everyone. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Enjoyed Thank it. You. Okay. Wonderful. Bye now. Bye. And thank you to all the uh, the, the uh, familiar faces and names that I see. Uh, nice to see that. And uh, glad you could join us, Catherine and Barbara. Um, I won't go around and name everyone, but it's good to see that you're here. So thank you. And uh, onward with Whitman. Yes. <laughs> good night now. All right. Good night, everyone.